everyone who is watching and who is here today. We are all thankful for our mothers. But we are thankful for our parents, not just mothers. We are thankful for our parents. And in view of, um, of that, I, I prepared a sermon today. I know some of you might expect a Mother's Day sermon, but I wanted to actually emphasize today parenting in general, uh, because it takes two to parent. Uh, unfortunately, there's many times there's only one parent when there are two people in the house, but only one parent, and that is a problem that we face today in many families. So I entitled my sermon this morning, A Recipe for Godly Parenting. Um, <clears throat> during the month of May, um, the theme is faith-building relationships, and parent-child relationship is one of the most formative relationships in the lives of many, many people. The parents are forming the faith of their children, and it's, they're passing on their faith to next generation. So this parent-child relationship is, as I said, one of the most important relationships uh, in the lives of every person. Now, family life can be stressful, and with various pressures on families, it's not always easy to be good parents. Um, we certainly understand that probably right now much better during this COVID-19 crisis. Many parents are faced with challenges they have never faced before. Um, and amidst all of that, the parents and the children must develop and nurture their relationship. I know it must be much harder right now to, be, uh, to always be nurturing parents because your kids are home all the time right now. Uh, you know, I've, I've been communicating with some family me uh, members, uh, church members and family members, and, and they say, it's a tough one right now because we're always home in each other's faces, right? And if we survive this one, we don't kill each other, we'll be okay. Uh, I know they're just kidding and joking, but whenever you have to be together all the time and rub shoulders at all times, it can be challenging. It can be challenging. And so this time, more so than any time before, this parent-child relationship is very, very important in the life of the children and the parents. Um, the parent-child relationship is one that nurtures the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual development of the child. The relationship, this, this relationship lays the foundation for the child's personality, for the child's life choices, and his overall behavior in his life. So these are very, very important times and I, I wish that the parents would use these times, actually. I think it might be a blessing in disguise for the families right now because they can spend time together, which they never had before this time. So use this time to really form that relationship between parents and children between, in, in marriages. And so I will talk today about parent-child relationship, and next week I will talk about the marriage relationship, which is a very, very important one as well. But now, I want to just make something very clear. Um, if you're watching right now and you're not a parent, I don't want you to turn off your, your, your computer or TV at this time. I believe that the principles we're going to uh, talk about today from the Word of God are very applicable to anyone that is a mentor in the, in the life of a child. Um, everyone has an influence in someone's child's life, all right? So uh, you can be a mentor, you can be an uncle, you can be an aunt, you can be a grandfather, grandmother, um, or just being a church member that you're in the church and you have an influence on, on children because um, to parent, to raise a child, it says it takes what? A whole village. It's not just the parent. So Please don't turn off uh, the live stream right now. If you're not a parent, there are some principles that you can learn today how to be a great mentor to a child in your life or to anyone else out there based on the Word of God. So, now, when we talk about new parents, and I was a new parent, and it's very, very challenging. Um, most of new parents, they make a very surprising discovery right after their child is, is born, and the discovery is that children do not come with an instruction manual. And I know Donna is here and she knows what I mean by that. 
children do not come with instruction manual. You're getting a new life in your hands, and you're responsible for that child, and you're young at that time. Maybe you've read a lot of books beforehand, but those don't really help much. They help somewhat, but not as much. And so parenting is not easy right from the beginning because there is no real an instruction manual that comes with a child. It can be really challenging at times. It can bring out the best in us or the worst in us. There was a pastor who gave a talk about parenting even before he had a child. And now that's a dangerous thing to do, to lecture someone on parenting when you're not a parent. We always know everything before we become parents. So this, this pastor entitled his, uh, his talk, How to Raise Your Children. Then he had his first child. It took him some time before he gave this talk again, and when he gave the talk, he changed the title into Suggestions for Struggling Parents. <laughs> he understood that you can't really give a lot of advice to people on how to raise your children until you have your own, so now he changed the title to Suggestions to Struggling Parents. Then he had two more children, and things changed again. Again, he changed the title into Hints, for hopeless parents. <laughs> and so, finally, when his children became teenagers, he ended up with just one question in his talk. And the question was, anyone here got a few words of wisdom? That's all he could say when his children grew up to be teenagers. This shows you how challenging parenting is. Uh, we know everything about parenting before we have our own children, or we can give advice based on the books we read and everything. But when we have our own children, it's a completely different story. We learn as we go, and we pray that God will give us the wisdom and the strength and mostly the patience to know how to deal with our children. The truth is that we always know best before we have our own children. Someone once said, a couple said, when we first married, we had three theories on how to raise kids. Now we have three kids and no theories, okay? We always know best when we don't have our children. But God, the author of life, the one that gives us these gifts, the children to us, he has what to tell us about how to raise our children. James Dobson, in his book, The Strong-Willed Child, he says this, I like this because he compares raising children, he says raising children is like baking a cake. He says this, you don't realize you have a disaster until it's too late. <laughs> and I like that. Raising children is like baking a cake. You don't realize you have a disaster until it's too late. Probably all of you, those who bake cakes before, know what he's talking about. And those who have children, probably a lot of you know what he's talking about. But success in both child education and cake baking is best achieved by following a recipe. And so today, I would like to provide, offer to you a recipe, how to be successful parents or godly parents. And this, this recipe comes from the Word of God. Now, as a good chef, or if you bake, you love baking, or you like to cook, you know that a recipe can be adjusted to your own liking. The, what, the, the ingredients I'm going to provide today to you are just basic ingredients that are very necessary, but the rest you can adjust to your own parenting style. You can adjust to your own recipe. You can add or take out ingredients. That's how uh, chefs always do and, and good cooks. But I'm going to provide to you three basic ingredients, what the Bible tells us how we can be godly parents or godly mentors in the lives of children. Number one, the first ingredient in our recipe for godly parenting is to recognize that your child is a gift from God. That's number one. We must recognize that our children are gifts from God. 
uh, if we are going to survive the challenges of parenting, we must remember that a child is a gift from God. And Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And the first part here, Psalmist says, the children are a heritage from the Lord. What is a heritage? It's an inheritance that you get as a gift. So children are a heritage. Children are a gift from God. We must remember as parents that our children are worth the struggle and that they're a gift from God, even if sometimes you like to return those gifts back to God. We do that sometimes. We get gifts at our different events, especially at Christmas or birthdays. If you don't like it, you do what? You return it. And some days, as a parent, you might feel that you want to return that gift back to God, meaning your children, and only God knows how many times I felt that way. But having a positive attitude, having a positive mindset about your children is very, very important. If you start this with the mindset that my child is a gift no matter what happens it will bring you back to that positive attitude but if you start with a negative attitude about your children you'll always go back to that negative instead of the positive so this mindset having an, an attitude that your child uh, is a gift will help you in your parenting no matter how hard it might be and no matter how hard it might get at times when we look at the parenting in the Bible, so number one is you have to recognize that your child is a gift from God. That's number one ingredient. The next two, I'd like to introduce them a little bit. And so when we look at the Bible and we look at the parenting in the Bible and try to define the parent-child relationship, um, what words do you think the Bible used most often to describe this relationship? And as I was looking and researching and studying this topic, um, some of you would probably think right away the word love is the first word that would describe this parent-child relationship. The interesting fact is that love is never used in the Bible to describe a relationship between a parent and a child. You can search. I've searched everywhere. I took the dictionaries and encyclopedias like we talked in the Sabbath school. Love is never used. You'll be hard-pressed to find in the Bible a statement that says, parents love your children or children love your parents. Now, you might think that that is strange, and you might think that this is ironic, and you would be correct. The book... The Bible that talks about love so much and emphasizes love in our relationship with God and others. But somehow, when talking about parents and children, the Bible never qualifies this relationship with the word love. So is this relationship not supposed to be based on love or built on love? Well, let's first carefully look at the words the Bible uses to qualify this relationship. And as we do so, we will discover two more ingredients for the recipe for godly parenting and we'll understand why Bible really doesn't use the word love in regards to parents and children. There are many texts in the Bible, and I'll go very quick, quickly through them. Most of you know them, but I'll just mention the main idea in the every text. Proverbs 22, verse 6. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. Train. Remember, train up. Remember the words that the Bible describes a parent-child relationship. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 9, the Bible tells to the parents, teach your children diligently. So train up. Teach. These are two words that we have as description of parent-child relationship. Ephesians 6 verse 4 says that the parents should bring their children up in the what? Training and admonition of the Lord. Once again, the word training is mentioned and admonition. As you can see from these passages, and there are many, many other passages that talk about this, the words that are repeated often are what? Teach, train up, 
and bring them up in admonition and training of the Lord. These ones are used to describe the task of the parents towards their children. Train them, teach them, admonish them, guide them. This brings us to the second ingredient in the recipe for godly parenting. Godly parents will teach and train their children in the ways of the Lord. Parents must train and teach their children. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 9, God tells the Israelites that they had to teach their children all his commandments. This was a vital task if the Israelites wanted their children to follow God. And the Bible uses a very interesting word. It says, teach them diligently. This word describes uh, these are the people that are doing the teaching they must be doing it tirelessly, and they must persevere in this process of education. It means be diligent. Much care and diligence is required in the teaching of children. Now, the teachings are not automatically transferred from one generation to another. In order to transmit the commandments to the next generation, it requires time and effort, being diligent. Now, do you see any hints of love in the word train, teach, time, effort. Do you see love in there? These are just hints. But we can see the Bible never directly uses the word love, but uses some other words that really express love. And we'll come back to that. The passage in Deuteronomy 6 clearly shows that teaching the teaching process happens continually, and it happens in two main ways. The parents are supposed to teach the children with their words and also with their life example. There is a saying, and most of you know that, monkey see what monkey do. This expression describes someone who imitates another person's actions, good or bad, and simply by having watched them before. And right now especially, the children are always home. They're watching you all the time. And whatever you say, whatever you do, the children will imitate us. They watch us even if we think they don't. And that's the most dangerous one. <laughs> Sometimes the kids would come to you and say, Oh, but you said this. Where did I say that? <laughs> uh, because they always watch us. It is a good thing if they watch us because they learn from us. But it can be a bad thing if we don't have a good example to show to them. Children are more likely to follow our example and not our advice. James Baldwin says that children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. Children are not good to listen to their parents and elders and mentors, teachers, and so on and so forth, but they never fail to imitate them. So life example, what we do, speaks louder than words. Our actions speak much louder than words. So we have to be careful when children are around us, we must show them that we follow God with all our heart, with all our minds, and they will do that in as well. So in Deuteronomy 6, God tells us that we teach our children not just by talking about God's ways, but also by showing them an example in all the daily activities of life. There in verse 6 and 7, um, Moses says, you must uh, teach them while you walk with them, while you uh, eat with them. In every activity of life, you must teach your children. You must show them an example of a godly life in every activity that you're undertaking. The children learn by example, by imitating us. So the question that I have for you parents today is, <clears throat> Do our children have something to imitate? What do they see in us beside the time when we are in the church? Do they see one parent in the home and a completely different one in the church or out, outside of the home? That's called hypocrisy. If you're behaving one way with your child when you're at home and another way when you're in public in front of other people, the children will catch on that. And there is nothing else, nothing else that is much worse than hypocrisy. Children catch on on hypocrisy very quickly, 
and they're getting discouraged very much so if they see that in parents, in mentors, in pastors, in teachers, and so on and so forth. Those people, are the, uh, they are authority figures in the lives of the children. And when they see hypocrisy, it really discourages them. So parents, be careful the way you teach and train your children. So training and teaching is important. That's the second ingredient. And the question that I have, what will the training and teaching accomplish for our children? Well, very simple. The training and teaching we provide for our children will protect our children. Now, we talked a little bit in the Sabbath school about the influence of culture and society today on us as adults, but more so on our children. Society today is trying very hard to brainwash children with their version of truth. Uh, therefore, the parents have to fight back and protect their children with the truth of the Bible. And so if the parents miss the opportunity, then the children could be lost for eternity because it is much easier, I mean, it, it is much harder to re-educate an adult than to instruct a child. Now, we always invest money hundreds of thousands of dollars in evangelism. And that's not a bad thing. But evangelism appeals to adults. And you try to re-educate an adult when if we invested money in child evangelism and in parenting classes and, and, and in family courses that people can learn how to parent their kids properly, I think we would have much better results. And we wouldn't have to pay a lot of money to re-educate those adults because they didn't get that upbringing. So we must educate our children because the society is fighting hard for them. The culture of today is fighting hard for our children. Now, continuing in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you look in verses 10 to 14, God warned the Israelite parents before they entered the promised land that the society and culture of the land would be fighting for their children and that they had to fight back. The distractions of that culture when they enter into the promised land, God says it would be so great that they would have to have a plan in place how to fight against that. Especially in verse 11, Deuteronomy 6 verse 11, God mentions a few of the comforts of life they're going to enjoy in the new place. And God says, when you get into the promised land, you'll have houses full of, full of good things and hewn out wells and vineyards and olive trees. It means you'll have the comforts of life. Um, they were slaves in Egypt. They had nothing. Then they traveled through the desert for 40 years. They had nothing. And now they're entering into the promised land and they get all these comforts. Do you think that that would affect how they would follow God? Absolutely. God is trying to tell the Israelites to not allow these temporal things to get in the way of serving him. Pleasures and comfortable life have a, a tendency, have a way of affecting people's relationship with God. And we see that in our lives as well. People quickly forget about God when they're very content. One of the consequences of parents forgetting about God is that they fail to transmit their faith to their children, and thus the next generation grows up without a godly foundation. Just as God cautioned Israelite in the past, so today God is cautioning us as well. He is warning us, parents, mentors, teachers, He's warning us, uh, about the influence of this ungodly culture today in the lives of our kids. Passing spiritual values on to the next generation is an intentional and continual process. So that is why the Bible repeatedly tells the parents to teach, to instruct, and train up their children. It is important to understand that even if the Bible does not say directly that the parents must love their children, Indirectly, love is implied in the time and effort they invest in their children to teach them, to train them, and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. That is true love. If parents really love their children, they will want to teach them to choose God so that they can have eternal life. 
If the parents really love their children, they will want to warn them about the dangers of disobeying God. That is true love seen in action. Indirectly, this is what love is all about. Parents love their children. That's why they teach them. That's why they train them and raise them in the ways of the Lord. Now, there are two main mistakes that parents make in the parenting of their children when they teach them and train them. First, and this one is a very tricky one, and I want to be very careful with this. And we all have done this in our parenting style or teaching style or being a mentor to a child. The first mistake we make is that unintentionally, most of the times unintentionally, we force our religion on our children. And I want to use this word unintentionally because it happens unintentionally. While the parents, and I want to be very clear, the parents are given this great responsibility <clears throat> to guide their children. And while they're given this responsibility, the parents must understand one important thing, that they cannot force their will on the children. <clears throat> Why? Because God gave free will to everyone. You cannot force the free will of your child. Yes, you have the responsibility to train and teach them. But we must understand that God created your child with a free will as well. Parents' task is to assist. And I want to emphasize this. The task of a parent is to assist their children, in using their free will to make the best possible choices. If you start forcing on the free will of your child and forcing your religion on the child, they will eventually rebel against it. And as a pastor, I've seen many, many, many examples. I know parents do it lovingly. They want their children to be in the church. They want to teach them. But sometimes they cross the line. Because of free will, there is always a possibility that the children might reject their parents' best efforts to lead them into a relationship with Jesus. It is unfortunate, as disappointing as it may be for the parents not to have their children follow their faith, their task is to keep on loving their children no matter of the decisions they make. And boy, that is a tough one. That is a tough one. I'm speaking as a parent, and I have young children right now. I still don't have those problems, but I know a lot of parents. I've been a youth pastor, and I have talked to many crying parents that the, the child chose not to be in the church anymore. They left God. They left the faith. It is a tough one to swallow. But once again, we must remember, they have a free will. They have a free will, and we must help them along. Now, uh, that is why teaching and training children is vital from young age. Um, because by continual teaching, parents create an atmosphere where faith of their children can thrive. You see, I'm saying they create an atmosphere where their faith can thrive. You don't force that on them. You're just creating an environment where children can easily follow God. The parents must consistently show their children the value and relevancy of faith in Christ. By doing this, they will increase the likelihood of their children to choose to hold on to their faith when they grow up. Now, it's not a given. It's not a guarantee. But you increase the likelihood of them choosing to hold on to that faith that you had taught them when they were younger. So this is the first mistake that we make in teaching our children, is to force our faith on our kids. The second mistake is the opposite one. There are many parents today that don't teach their children God's truth. <laughs> they fall from one extreme to the other because they have the misconception that the teachings will automatically transfer from one generation to another. They don't need to put the effort. They don't need to put the time. It will somehow transfer to the next generation. This is something that parents must not take for granted. It's not going to happen automatically. 
The spiritual training in the home is so important that Ellen White makes this following statement. It's a very strong statement. She makes this in um, Adventist Home on page 318, and she says this. If religion is to influence society, it must first influence the home circle. Religion should not be divorced from home education. In the home, the foundation is laid for the prosperity of the church. The influences that rule in the home life are carried into the church life. Therefore, church duties should first begin in the home. This is a very strong statement, but it's a very powerful statement because she says this, society, church, and the world as as a whole depends on, on the home. Everything starts in the home. So if parents miss this opportunity to be the godly teachers that God put them uh, in charge to be and to teach their children, the church will suffer and the society will suffer because the parents are not doing their job. So these are two misconceptions that parents have. We must be somewhere in the middle. We must be godly parents where we teach, train our children to love the Lord their God with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind. Let me go quickly to the third ingredient. So the third ingredient in godly parenting, and some of you might have a problem, parents, with this. The newer, the new style parenting will have a problem with this. I'm an old style parent, okay? Um, There are many passages in the Bible, especially in Proverbs, a number of passages. I I can't even count all of them at this time, but they talk about parents applying discipline and correction to their children. And if you have a problem with that, just give me a moment to explain what I mean, okay? Because I know some parents have problem with discipline or correction. So this brings me to the third ingredient in recipe for godly parenting, which is discipline. Correction. Um, I know that this word discipline became a bad word today, and it's unfortunate. And and it happened because of some parents, many parents, abusing really discipline. And I and I you know I acknowledge that it's it's really bad what's happening. But the word I like, the word that the Bible uses for this process is correction. (laughs) I like the word correction. Um, this implies that the children are taking a wrong direction at some point in time, and the parents must correct their direction so that they stay on the right path, gently correcting your children. Now, experts in air navigation have a rule of thumb known as one in 60 rule. Have you heard about one in 60 rule? It states that for every one degree a plane veers off its course, it misses its target destination by one mile for every 60 miles. Just one degree. And it might seem a very small, uh, you know, veering off the course, one degree. But every 60 miles, you go off course one mile. That is dangerous. That is extremely dangerous. This means that the further you travel, the further you are from your destination. If you veer off course by one degree flying around the equator, you will land almost 500 miles off target. It might seem a small little thing, one degree mistake but it makes a huge difference. So the point here is that small actions accumulated over a very long time make a huge difference. This is what happens with our children. Every small deviation from the course that is not corrected immediately has a great potential to end up in a devastating end. And how do we correct? It's by applying discipline. Discipline really means more than just punishing your kids. Some uh, uh, parents misunderstand that discipline is just punishing them, physical punishment or mental and uh, emotional punishment. No. Discipline means creating a structure for your kids, and they fall into that structure. Kids like structure, and they follow structure. If you implement a correct godly structure, that's what discipline is all about, and they will follow that in their lives. And when they veer off of that structure and come out of it, you just correctly correct them gently and bring them back to the course. And what is the destination? Is the eternal life. If you allow your kids 
every time to just get off course and you don't correct them, ultimately it will come a point where it, it might be too late. It might be too late. So parents, use correction, use discipline in a godly way to correct your child to be back on course. In Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, those he loves, he rebukes and disciplines. If you would ask children whether correction and discipline expresses love, they would most certainly say no. But the Bible clearly shows that love is expressed through correction and discipline. <laughs> you know, uh, I know that no child likes to hear the cliche, I punish you because I love you. <laughs> Nobody likes to hear that. But if discipline is applied correctly, then in the long run, it is an expression of love of the parents towards children. So here I'd like to offer a word of caution, as I said, to parents. Make sure that your discipline is for the purpose of correcting a wrong behavior and, not to, bring a po and, and to bring a positive change in the life of the child. If it is unfortunate that many parents apply discipline with wrong reasons and abuse it, and the results are very devastating. When the parents spend time teaching and training their children in the ways of the Lord and apply corrective measures when necessary with love, the children will most likely respond with an attitude of honor and respect and will obey the parents as the Bible asks the children to do out of love for their parents and not out of fear. This is a parent-child relationship. Parents apply teaching, correction, and the children respond with love, respect, and honoring their parents. Let me conclude with an illustration. Two children were heard discussing their parents. The first said, I'm really worried, he says. It was a little guy. Dad slaves away at his job so that I have everything I need, so I'll be able to go to college someday. Mom works hard washing and ironing and cleaning up after me, taking care of me when I'm sick and driving me everywhere. I, everywhere I want to go, they spend every day of their lives working for me. But I'm worried, says the little guy. And his friend asks, what have you got to worry about? And the little guy responds to him, I'm worried, I'm afraid they're going to try to escape someday. I let that sink in a little bit. <laughs> Parents, haven't we all felt like that some days? <laughs> Uh, we want to escape their routine and taking care of our children. Sometimes it's just one time for yourself. So when you have those moments, just remember that as parents, you have been given a great responsibility to bring your children up for the Lord. Along the way, you'll need some help. And the Bible provides the best recipe for godly parenting as we saw this in the Word of God. If parents follow the recipe... They will help their children become the masterpiece that God intended their children to be, the children of God. May God bless you in your parenting, and may God be with you as you raise your children in the ways of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity that we can be here, Lord, just a few of us, and most of, uh, most of other people watching from home, I pray that... Uh, you'll bless us on the Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, for the recipe that you give us in your word, how to be godly parents, godly mentors or influencers in the lives of children. We realize that Satan is fighting hard through culture and society and media today to get our children and to lead them to a devastating end, Lord, to eternal destruction. But, Lord, help us to fight back. Help us to fight back with the Word of God. Help us to teach them, to train them, to raise, up, raise them up in your ways. And if necessary, Lord, help us to be wise in applying correction and discipline in the lives of our children so that we can correct them from those patterns of behavior that might lead them to destruction. Give the strength and the courage to the parents to apply these ingredients in their parenting style. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.